welcome everybody. Um, thank you for coming. I am thrilled to say um, that this is uh, quite possibly the most popular webinar that, that we've run to date, and with good reason. Uh, you've made a, a very good choice uh, in joining us today. Uh, our expert, uh, George, is probably too polite to say so, but he really does know uh, what he's talking about. Uh, George has got about a decade's experience uh, of writing content for some of the biggest tech brands in, in the world, uh, as well as mentoring many of our new recruits here at Radix and setting kind of new writers off on, off on a good path. So really when it comes to giving you advice on straightening out the errors um, or the potential mistakes and pitfalls that you might make in your copy, you really could be in no safer hands and it gives me great pleasure to be embarrassing him like this. So, so before I, I, I go on too much uh, further, I, I'll hand over to, uh, to George Reith. George, take it away. Well, thank you, David, for that very glowing introduction. It's made me quite rosy cheeks. Uh, and uh, thank you everyone for, for joining in today. I'm really excited to talk to you about a uh, topic near and dear to my heart, which is making lots of mistakes and <laughs> trying to recover from them. But, um, Yes, I've obviously called this the deadly sins of B2B content, um, B2B technology, that's the sector where I specialize in, uh, in terms of content writing and marketing. Um, but I think this does have application to, to quite a broad range of people. So whether you're writing content regularly for your brand or someone else's, or if you have to don the hat of writing sometimes to review someone else's work and in a broader marketing role, like coordinating your content efforts. Um, I think there'll be something here for you. Um, on the B2C side as well, if you're a business to consumer marketer or content creator, I think there's something here for you too, but you may have to put up with some very B2B focused examples. So uh, just a little bit of housekeeping again, as we've said, please uh, jump in with questions early and often, pop them in the QA box uh, as soon as they come to your brain. Uh, we'll try and sort of answer questions as we go through each section of the webinar, but there will be time at the end for a chunkier, more general Q&A session. So please be, uh, be upfront with your questions. Um, and in terms of what we're going to cover today, it's quite a packed agenda, but we'll get through it. We'll uh, be looking first on, on why I'm focusing on mistakes. Some of you might be thinking, hmm, it's a bit negative, but I'll tell you why. There's wisdom to the madness. Um, I'll also tell you a little bit about me. I'm not going to massively oversell myself or anything, but uh, I figure you might want to know that it's not going to be a complete waste of your time. <laughs> and then we'll cover the seven deadly, seven deadly sins uh, in order. There's a sneak peek of them up there for you. Uh, and in each one, we'll obviously delve into that uh, challenge a little bit more. I'll give you a real copy example I found in, 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 out in the wide world, and I'll show you how I tweak it and give some general advice on avoiding uh, that mistake in future. And then, of course, at the end, as I said, we'll have time for a few uh, questions and answers, which uh, would be really great. But first, this is where the first poll comes in. You need to get a little bit of interactivity in there, so it's not just me rambling on. Uh, I'd like to know a little bit more about you. Some of you have already been uh, typing in the chat box and telling us about where you're from, but I'd love to know uh, a little bit more about your specific role and how involved you are in, in, uh, in writing. Are you a freelance writer? Do you work with an agency? Are you an in-house writer? Are you in another marketing role that isn't directly responsible for writing, but is adjacent to it? Or are you something completely different? Maybe you're a student, maybe you're a role I haven't even thought of. I only had so many radio buttons, so you can click other and uh, feel free to type in in chat if you uh, want to go into detail about what your role is and your relationship to writing in your company. I think we've got almost all of the uh, the attendees of uh, of Click Now, George. I think they're just kind of one or two, just being a a, a, a little shy. Well, don't be shy. There's, there's no judgment. I promise. I'm not going to bash on freelancers. Really. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I can't see the uh, results on my screen, unfortunately, David. So I may need to ask you to MC for me. And, uh, yes, me it's uh, oh, of course. On. Hold on. Oh, there we are. That's a one. If I click end, do you see them? Uh, oh, how about I share the results? How's that? Yeah, do you see them now? That's what I want to see. It's a, it's, a, it's a broad spread, I think. It's a very broad spread. So 29% of you are marketers. Some of you are freelance writers. 10% of you, 19% agency. 33% are, are writing in-house. That's really cool. And uh, two of you have said you're from another role. If you'd like to type in the chat box and tell me what that role is, 
I'd love to know. Um, my, my aim here is to just understand a little bit more about the spread of people we have today, because, of course, I want to make this as relevant to you as possible. Um, no point uh, preaching to the choir if <laughs> everybody's tilted one way. But we've got a really good spread. So I think there'll be something here for everyone. So the next part, I just want to put a little bit about why I'm focusing on mistakes, because it might seem a little bit true. But um, from my experience, Mistakes are really easy to spot and can be the biggest thing you can do to give your content a huge boost in terms of its quality and performance. Now, of course, we'd all want to be fantastic writers and to work with fantastic writers, deliver the best copy we can at the time. Uh, but what defines good versus great can be very fine and difficult to spot and very subjective, of course. What would be amazing copy for, say, a fresh startup uh, organization might not be appropriate for a very uh, long serving institution. So I think if you focus instead on the fundamentals, it can be uh, a little clearer how to find a path to delivering really, really strong copy that gets you results. So I promise it's not just me being cynical and negative, maybe a little bit. So a little bit about who I am, just so you know, this isn't uh, I'm, not, I'm not just some shill who's going to waste your half an hour. <laughs> so um, I'm the handsome one second from the right, in case that wasn't obvious. Um, but more importantly, I'm, I'm part of this really good team at Radix. Um, we've got about a dozen uh, writers in-house writing full-time, dedicated to B2B technology content. And uh, in my time working here, I've had the pleasure of being mentored by many of them, where they've called me out on the mistakes I've made and helped me learn. Uh, and I've gone on to, to mentor quite a few of them as well and, and offer the same guidance to, to new writers coming through. Um, and in my time doing that, I've worked with quite a lot of uh, big names in the B2B sector. Um, and as you know, many of these brands, they don't become big household names uh, by settling for second best. They uh, will really tell you if you're not delivering the results they want to see. Um, so I've been lucky to work with them and learn a lot in the process. But um, I appreciate that's me kind of self-aggrandizing and telling you, look at all these brands I've written for. So um, seeing as this is about mistakes, I should probably also tell you a lot of bad feedback over the years. I was young and foolish once too. I've had a few things uh, come my way, more general gentle feedback at the top, ranging to the soul destroying and the nightmare inducing down below. Um, you know, you can't win them all. But I've learned, you know, I've grown from this and I feel it's helped put me in a place where I can help other writers, uh, both in my organization and hopefully in yours, uh, correct these mistakes and not get this kind of feedback. <laughs> these shocked faces in the chat that's, that's my reaction as well for sure <laughs> um, so let's move on to, to some of these um, uh, seven deadly sins and what we can do to avoid them so my first one is making promises that you can't keep or won't keep um, and I do mean literal promises here if you're sending out an email that says hey come join this webinar and then there's no webinar it's a pretty obvious one but I also mean more generally setting up a punchline, you then have to resolve it later in your content. You can't leave loose threads. Uh, so internal logic is extremely important. Um, you have to resolve points that you set up. Um, you can't just sort of throw out a challenge and then never address it <laughs> later on in your ebook. It feels, of course, quite unsatisfying. Um, and I think it's very important to make it very clear to the reader how everything connects in your piece. Um, I'm not saying we need to be really direct and spelling it out, but I think if there's not an obvious chain of you know, setting up a challenge and then going, okay, here's how this affects your industry, and here's how this solution comes in, and here's the benefits of it. If that gets muddied, I think it can be suddenly quite tiring to read your content. Um, and obviously, especially for those in B2B like me, we write for very smart people, sure, but uh, even the smartest people among us, I, I don't think anyone's ever complained about something being too easy to read. So uh, I think making it straightforward and, and obvious where the logic is going in your narrative is uh, a really crucial thing to do. Um, here's a bit of an example for you. So obviously in the era post GDPR, it's quite hard to accidentally wind up on a mailing list. But before then, when it was a bit more of a wild west, I, I somehow got signed up to a newsletter from a company that um, does consultancy around regulatory compliance, which I know is uh, probably getting everybody feeling very excited right now. Um, and I'm on this newsletter, and I don't mean to pick on them. I actually don't think it's bad content at all. It's very targeted to the, uh, the topic at hand. However, um, it's just sort of what came up into my inbox when I was looking for good examples. Um, and there's a few things I'd like to tweak, uh, particularly about this one. I think it has quite a clear through line uh, about Sarbanes-Oxley compliance, new ways to do it, and they've got a webcast about it, which sounds great. My issue is that we start off with the title. It's really good. It talks about Sarbanes-Oxley and internal control systems. Then we're like, bang, webinar, straight away. Okay, fine, then 
back to Sarbanes Oxley again, a little bit more about that. Then, but join this webcast, okay, guys? And then oh, I'm gonna go back to Sarbanes Oxley. It's a little stop start. They try and dovetail a little bit too much. I think it just slightly overcomplicates the flow of the email. So what would I do to tweak it? I'd keep the title the same because I like it. it. Even tells you how long the webcast is gonna be, nice. Uh, and I'd just keep it more straightforward. We'd start with Sarbanes-Oxley, we'd set the scene. Hey, you might need another way to uh, approach compliance with this particular regulation. We've got a webcast that can help you do that. We've got lots of experts talking on it from the big four. And if you tune in, you'll learn one, two, three, four bullet points of really amazing benefits that the, um, the reader will get. Uh, I haven't put the bullet points in just to save on space, but hopefully you get the idea that just by simplifying, the setting up the problem, moving forward to the solution, which of course is to go through to the webinar, it's just going to be a little bit cleaner. So how do we avoid this sin in general? How do we stop that from happening in the first place? First thing is to, of course, plan your structure before you start drafting. Um, I find when you're looking for how threads connect, particularly in a long piece of an ebook or along the blog, if you're looking at you know, a whole draft full of words, it can sometimes be hard to spot those connections and make sure they're there. I think if you plan it in advance and you're just looking at a list of bullet points and an outline or a plan, it's much easier to see, oh yeah, I've talked about this challenge and I've never come back to it. I need to put something in here to resolve that point. You've got to edit ruthlessly, of course. Um, I'm sure everyone here knows that. I'm going to be beating this point quite a few times because it's really important and it ties into quite a lot of things. If you edit a lot um, and you take the time to really go through a piece multiple times, it can be quick to see where you are not quite guiding the reader enough between points. So I think that's a really important way to avoid this as well. So uh, before we move on to this second one, you're probably all excited to dive into it, but I thought I'd take the opportunity. David, have we had any Q&As come through yet? Uh, no questions yet, but mm -hmm. just uh, Miriam said that her other role is she, uh, she was one of the people that clicked other, and she said mm -hmm. she manages a team of freelance and in-house writers and editors. Nice. Very cool, Miriam. Well, hopefully there's something for you here that will be useful for either. Probably not yourself, but maybe your team would find some of this beneficial. So um, yeah, please share the love. Great. Well, again, like I said, please jump in with your questions. I'm sure it's just because you're so enraptured by what I'm saying. You just want to hear me keep going with no interruption. But uh, please do interrupt me and give me a chance to catch my breath. OK, let's move on to the second one. Not getting to the point. Um, I think this one's pretty obvious, but we've got a few things we can, uh, we can say here. So obviously, you only get one chance to make a first impression. You don't have long to capture a reader's attention, especially depending on what you're writing. If you've got a whole ebook to play with, you have more room. If you have an email, you may have a single subject line in which to really get someone's ears to perk up. Um, you can't waste that opportunity. And I think we all want that perfect intro that kind of sets the scene, but then gradually goes into the more specifics. Um, but I think if you put it too high level, especially if you don't have a lot of words to play with, um, it's, uh, it can get people to tune out pretty quickly. I'm, I'm sure we've all seen that content that starts with, in today's challenging economic climate, <laughs> and just sat there going, oh yeah, that challenging economic climate again. Huh? So of course we want to avoid things like that. I'm not saying anyone in this room, of course, would make that mistake, but I've, I've seen it happen. So you need to pick the right ticket to go in. So a bit of a weird example. It's a project I worked on and I can't show you any copy, so I don't want to break a non-disclosure agreement, but I can show you this picture from uh, the Greek mythology canon. Um, if anybody can guess who this is, you get a gold star. Give you a few seconds to have a think. I promise this is relevant, by the way. I will get to the point. That's the part of the sin. If you guess that this is Prometheus, you would be correct, and you can give yourself a pat on the back. And uh, for anyone who isn't familiar with that myth, Prometheus uh, climbs Mount Olympus and takes the fire of knowledge, brings it back to man so they can become enlightened for the first time. And uh, Zeus does some very horrible things to him in punishment. It's not a very nice tale, so I'll leave it at that. But anyway, I was asked by a client to uh, edit a... 10,000 word thesis someone had written on AI and its uh, place in the modern world. It's a very focused paper on ethics. It was all about, you know, what happens when businesses start using AI? What moral conundrums do we need to consider um, as artificial intelligence becomes more pervasive in business and our lives? And they started with this big Prometheus myth. Now, it was a long paper, so they had a fair bit of time to kind of weave in this, uh, this, this metaphor first. And I was quite excited when I read it. I thought, I see where you're going with this fire of knowledge. This is like AI is bringing a new fire of knowledge. But if we're not careful, we will be punished as well. I thought, that's cool. I like that. 
Unfortunately, though, the Prometheus myth carried on for another 2,000 words, and it's safe to say that my enthusiasm was slightly dampened by the, uh, the end of reading that many words on it. Um, it wound up being an okay paper, actually, at the end, but yes, there was a lot of cutting to do in that section. So how would I tweak it? Don't need to waste your time too much with this. I would simply only use 250 words to talk about Prometheus, or if it was going to be a much shorter piece, I'd probably have to cut it completely, which is a shame, but... There we go, you've got to kill your darlings from time to time, as we all know. Uh, how do you avoid this sin more generally? Of course, you need to be very aware of what you're writing. As we've said already, if you're writing something longer, you have a little bit of time to play around with. If you're writing an email or a very short blog, you cannot waste a single word. <laughs> you need to be absolutely ruthless about getting to the point very quickly. Um, I'd also urge you to consider who you're writing for. We'll have a little bit more about, about this later with knowing your audience. But um, at a high level, what we're talking about here is the idea that some job titles are, of course, going to be, going to be much more time poor than others. Now, if you're writing for the C-level, very high-level decision maker, they'll probably have some time built into their role to consider strategically important things and read content about it. So you maybe have a little room to play with more than you would certainly if you're talking to someone on the ground, like engineer or a person on the sales floor you know they've got a lot of work to do and they don't have time built in to be reading a very long prometheus myth so i would urge you to get to the point and make it very clear to them what the benefits are as quickly as you can and of course my old favorite suggestion do some editing get someone else to read it preferably because while you may love your extremely extended complicated fancy intro someone else might read it and sort of go eh? what's this so that will give you a very quick clue as to whether you're um, spinning your wheels a little too much in your intros. Perfect. So, David, feel free to jump in and shout if you get any questions. If not, I'll just carry on. No, they're all stunned into silence by your brilliance. Stunned oh, no, silence. wait, we have got one. Melanie Ooh. says, Thank you, Melanie. Uh, any top tips for identifying the most important information to keep in long pieces like the one you describe? Ah, see, that is an excellent question. And I'm not going to answer it right now because you've given us all a bit of a spoiler alert for one of the upcoming Deadly Sins. So hold fire on that, Melanie. I promise I'll get around to it. I will answer your question. And uh, thank you for typing it in. It's really, really cool. So let's jump on to the third one. Having too much to say. So hopefully this one will, will wrap up your point there, Melanie. So normally I think a lot of, whether it's an internal stakeholder you're working with or an external client, you're a freelancer working in an agency i think you know some clients and stakeholders think they're doing us a massive favor by sending them through loads of information on the project on products you're writing on the business etc um sometimes it's a bit of a curse <laughs> if you have too much to look at too much to try and cram in it's very busy in your content um you can have too much of a good thing of course as we know in my view i think every single part of your content should do one thing and do it impeccably well so every sentence has one clear topic Every paragraph has one big thing it's trying to cover. Every whole piece of content even needs to have a focus. Obviously, something larger like an ebook, you can kind of pull in some other strands and go into a bit more detail. But I think you shouldn't stray from the sort of core message you're trying to get across. It needs to have that driving force behind it. It all needs to do one thing and do it as well as it possibly can. Here's a little example of how that works with my compliance pen pals. Sorry again for picking on them. <laughs> We've got quite a lot going on in this paragraph. In Orange, I've highlighted quite a lot of challenges they've raised about this topic of harnessing technology to mitigate compliance risks. They start off with challenges, which of course is very advisable. They then move on to some of the benefits I've highlighted in purple, some of the reasons why you should definitely be looking into this, and then it gives us a suggestion of some solutions we might uh, take to, to solve these issues. However, that's all in one paragraph. <laughs> it's quite a lot to digest. I um, If I was a compliance professional and this landed in my inbox, I might be a bit turned off by how quite beastly this paragraph is. So there's a few things we can do to tweak things like this when they pop up. Um, I've switched the title around, it's a bit picky on my part, but I think leading with the benefit and then talking about the solution just feels a little bit more relevant, shows the reader they're definitely gonna get something out of this. Um, and then I would focus on one thing at a time in each paragraph. Short paragraphs I feel are really appropriate for emails in particular. So I'd have this short one here, diving into a little bit about some of the challenges people are facing currently. Then I talk a little bit about what people are doing to solve it, the dangers of not investigating this properly and sitting on your hands. And then, of course, we do the big reveal of got to get this asset. It's going to tell you how to fix that. So, again, probably the same rough word count there, just split up. And I think it immediately makes things more readable, more clear, hopefully more helpful. 
So back to your question, Melanie, from earlier, how do you avoid this sin? You need to know what to cut and when to cut it. And unfortunately, a big part of this just comes down to experience. Um, but of course, I'm sure lots of you have that experience already. You've already got that intuition. I think people sometimes need to give themselves permission to listen to that gut feeling of like, is this relevant? So I would urge you to listen to that voice in your head. I'd urge you to be extremely ruthless with the information you're given. Anything that doesn't support that one thing, piece needs to do that, paragraphs needs to do, etc. I think you should be quite bold about cutting it or moving it somewhere else to another piece of content, maybe or another paragraph, another sentence, what have you. And I think you shouldn't be afraid to explain why you're doing that and when. Um, I think, you know, our clients, our stakeholders, our subject matter experts come to us because they want expert guidance on what good content looks like. And I think we need to be courageous in saying to them, you know, I'm telling you as someone who does this a lot, that you need to focus on this. This is your ticket. In. Of course, if you're not comfortable doing that, I totally get that. I think just bat it back to them and let them answer the question. Say, look, there's a lot here. We've only got 500 words. What's the top thing? What are the two things we need to say? What's the one thing? It's the top three benefits. Ask them the question and let them kind of guide you that way. Cool. Hopefully that answers the question for you, Melanie. Very roundabout way with multiple slides, but we got there in the end. Cool. So David, do feel free to interrupt me as and when we have questions, or I'll just keep plowing through. No, I think we're um, we're right to uh, to keep going. I, was, I I just kind of was making the point in the chat that I think a lot about this, as well as experience, is about knowing your audience and, and what they care about and why it makes a difference to them as well. Mm. You know, having your audience in mind is always important when you're cutting stuff, I think. Absolutely. It's a topic I may or may not address later. Dum, dum, dum. Okay, enough spoilers. <laughs> Let's uh, crack on. But again, like I said, keep throwing your questions at me. I, I really enjoy answering them. Um, the next one is a bit of an inverse to our last thing, which is having too little to say. Of course, we know if you're running on fumes, you've got no brief in front of you. It's a very challenging situation to be in. So you've always got to be ready to ask for more. We're writers, marketers, we're not alchemists. You can't make something out of nothing. You've got to have some information to process and turn into fantastic books. Um, I've seen quite a few people try and do that thing where they're a little afraid to ask subject matter experts a question they don't think is sort of, they don't think is smart enough. They're worried they're gonna sound stupid. So they assume, oh, I'll just Google it, it'll, it'll be fine. But um, it sometimes works, but it's a big risk. I don't think it's worth it. Um, and I think this one is particularly difficult because in my opinion, Every writer has a sort of unique tell when they don't have quite enough to say and they're playing for word count. Um, a little bit more on that in a minute. But first, a quick example from you. I've, um, I've not picked on the compliance people this time. I varied it up. Um, it's a very short thing from an email marketing company about email deliverability and the perils with it. Quite an interesting topic. We've got a bit of an issue here in that it's committed a cardinal sin of emails where we have quite a good title here and then immediately repeat it basically in different words in a slightly more fleshed out way. Um, everything it's saying is good and it's actually pretty punchy. It just feels like it's kind of playing for time and it tells us there's a lot of expertise, but it doesn't really show us how. It doesn't go into details of what we might learn and, and things like that. It's just a few things missing. I'd like a bit more of a teaser of, of what this guide is gonna sort of do for us as readers. So how would I tweak it? A bit tricky this one because I've literally just told you not to go off having no information, but unfortunately I couldn't download the guide. The link didn't work for me because it was a bit of an old email. So I'm committing my own sin and I don't have the information to rewrite this properly, but I've given it a go anyway. I've thrown in a few questions in the title and in the opener just to spice it up. We're not quite repeating ourselves. We're asking a question. Why exactly does this happen? What are you going to do to stop it from happening? Um, it's a bit cheesy, I know, but you know, I didn't have much to work with. We were about to do it sometimes. Uh, and then I just try and be really concise with the rest of it. Our guide's going to answer those questions for you. It's going to give you some tips. Brilliant. And then I put the thing about the decade of experience, done it in a practical guide, compiled it. It's going to show you how to do these three things. Those bullets would be the key. I think that's the point where you have to like reveal a little bit about what that guide is going to say. Um, but I'm not able to do that because I don't have the guide. Sorry. But hopefully <laughs> you can see what I've done there to just speed through. I think. If you're really stuck and you don't have the information, you've just got to make it concise. That's the, the sort of key here. Um, so how do you avoid this, this sin in general? As I've said, I think every writer has a waffle phrase. They have a particular approach they use when they're a little bit nervous. And I think over time, you can work out what your own is. And it makes it very easy. Because the moment you spot yourself using it, you can be like, 
yeah, I need to get some more content in here. I need to get some actual ideas thrown in. I need to go back and ask, ask my subject matter experts some more info. Um, I can't really talk about waffle phrases now without telling you my own. Um, I need you to promise me though that you won't tell any of my colleagues. David's gonna hear it, but if any of the others hear it, they're gonna call me up on this in review and I'm gonna have a really hard life. So keep this to yourselves. My waffle phrase is, uh, I use that sentence structure where you go, while X is important, you must also consider Y. And you know, it's not, it's not a good use of words, frankly. So I'm working on it, don't worry. But I'd urge you to try and identify your own waffle phrases so you can work on those two and strip them out. Um, of course, you need to identify when you don't have enough information and be ready to ask for it. Um, I was always told that there's no such thing as a stupid question. One day, I'm sure someone will prove me wrong. <laughs> but in general, my experience, I've been on quite a few calls and I've never heard someone who's uh, an expert in their field get annoyed at answering questions. Like Most people like to talk about what they're, they're familiar with, what they know, what they're experts in. So feel free to ask questions, even basic ones. I think people are happy to give you the information. The only silly thing you can do is not ask the question and then start using waffle phrases like the kind I just told you that I use sometimes. <laughs> so there's your way to prevent this from happening. This is one of the ones I think where prevention is much better than cure. Try and do these things really early and get that information while you're on the call with a subject matter expert or stakeholder. Cool. Okay, moving on, but do stop me if there's any questions. I want to answer them. So too much writing, not enough editing. We've been building up to this one, the big editing one. I know you probably all have heard this a million times before, but we'll put a bit of interactivity in just to keep you on your toes. I'd really like to know a little bit more about your general approach for editing copy that either you've written or you've seen from someone else. Um, we'll pull up a poll in a second. I'd love it if you can let me know your general approach. I've got a few here. Obviously, there's so many ways to approach this. So please select other, type a little bit in, uh, in chat if you've got a really unique way of approaching editing. Um, maybe you'll be teaching me rather than me teaching you on this one. Cool, so we're running out of time to enter an answer. Remember, don't be shy. There is absolutely no judgment here. Yeah, well, there, there's just a, a, a few people that are either being shy or they're checking their emails. I'm um, not going to put anyone on blast. Don't worry. <laughs> if you use spell check, that's cool. I'm into it. Um, oh, there's, there's an other. There is at least one other. That would be interesting ooh, to know in the okay. chat what, what that is. Yeah, um, cool. yeah the, there's, there's a couple of people that haven't yet, but um, we can... Um, you know, they, they may be busy or something, so we can maybe close the <laughs> poll rather than, 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 than waiting for absolutely. Yeah, everybody. that's fine. Let's just share the results. Um, yeah, no, it's it's uh, interesting. There you mm. go. Nice. Okay, cool. No one's just relying on spell check. Very good. Well done. You passed the first test. Um, cool. A lot of people taking multiple passes through each document. That's really good to hear. I think um, I'll kind of go on to this in a minute in the slide, but I think if you have to review something on your own without anyone else looking at it. That's kind of the best way to do it. Um, ooh, someone said here, multiple passes then, subject knowledge expert then, internal review team. Nice, Emily, you are living the dream. This is kind of what we want. It's about just putting multiple layers of editing in as we will see. Um, cool, so I think you're all experts on this, so I won't take too long banging on in this one, but uh, I think it's a Hemingway quote, this one. There's no such thing as good writing, only good rewriting. Um, it's a cliche, but it's true. Uh, the best writers in the world have never produced a perfect first draft, so what hope do we mere mortals have? Uh, everyone makes typos, everyone flubs, it's fine. Just get it down on the page, and the editing is where the, the quality really comes into its own, I think. Um, I do think if you write something, you're probably too close to review it really well. Sometimes we have no choice, of course. Um, deadlines looming and no one has space in their diary, your colleagues are all slammed as well. Sometimes you, you've got to review it yourself, but um, I think uh, the human brain does that horrible thing where it fills in patterns. It, it doesn't look at what's on the page. It, it thinks about what we thought about while we were writing. And it can uh, mean you miss out on some, in my case, real humding of typos, let me tell you. So get someone else to look at it with a clear up head. Um, you'll pick up a lot of things that way. I can't really show you an example here, by the way, because, um, uh, you know, in theory, you should never see this in live copy, really, that's out there. Um, and again, I'm not going to pull up my own dirty laundry too much on this webinar. So <laughs> no example, but I can give you some tips on how to avoid it. Of course, the big one is just get someone else to look at your work. If you can push back a deadline, if you've got enough room to do that, to get someone else to put eyes on it, I always think it's worth doing. Um, if you are going to edit your own work, 
I always suggest going really slowly. And I mean like almost read aloud every syllable in your head. If you try and read at the speed you normally would when you're just reading something to digest information, it's inevitable you'll skip over a few things. If you sort of take the time to really go through each word, each syllable at a time, you'd be surprised how much you'll catch. Um, and of course, nearly everyone's doing this already. Take multiple passes through the document. Um, I try and split it up into different goals each time. So I'll do one looking at the structure, iron out any big ticket things where like a paragraph isn't mixing together or anything like that. Um, then you can go through and look at the phrasing. Are there any weird sentences that just aren't quite landing? And then when you've sorted that out, you can look through the grammar and the typos and the fun stuff. Um, nice. Yeah, good point about the read aloud feature in Word, David. That's a bit of a secret weapon. Uh, one of the people I, I, uh, I'm tutoring at the moment, they use the, uh, the, word, uh, the word read aloud feature a lot. I'm always knocked out by how consistent their copy is. So uh, it's a really good one. Um, do put headphones on, though. It always sounds a bit weird with the animatronic voice on, on the Microsoft uh, uh, Office suite. That's a really good suggestion. Cool. Okay, barring any questions, we'll move you on to the next one. Appreciate it. we've been going for a little while. I hope everyone's hanging in there. We've only got two more sins to cover, and these are some pretty juicy ones, so uh, do stay tuned. The next one is being too clever. Now, I'm going to sound like the fun police here. <laughs> when I say being clever, I... I don't necessarily mean you can't talk about complex topics or use industry jargon and technical terms, because of course, if you're in B2B, you're going to have to do that at some point. Um, otherwise, you're not going to seem credible to your audience. I mean that kind of writer clever, you know, when you, you know someone's there like, oh, itching to get a pun in there. Oh, I can't wait for this wordplay. Oh, I've got this structure for a case study. It's going to be really original. I think in a very experienced hand, those things can come together nicely. But I think for, for most people, I'd just say being focused, being Disciplined rather than smart is the way forward. Um, if you get overly clever at writing, <laughs> I'm going to, again, break one of my rules here because I'm going to use a metaphor to explain to you why you should never use metaphor. But <laughs> it's that David Ogilvy saying about copy being like a shop window. Even if there's anything on the glass, any kind of smudge, you're no longer looking at the product behind the window. You're looking at the glass. In this case, the copywriter is the glass. In case that wasn't clear. Um, so even if you succeed at landing your convoluted wordplay, if the reader suddenly goes, wow, that writer is really smart, you've kind of failed at your job because they're not thinking about the product or the company that you're representing anymore. And that would be a real shame. Um, if you join this webinar, you're probably very smart. So sadly, all of you are susceptible to this particular one. So uh, make sure you keep paying attention. <laughs> we don't want to distract from what we're trying to promote, of course. Let's have a look at this one, right? So this is an interesting one because I actually quite like the metaphor they're going for. They've got this thing about a compliance professional. It's like a cardiologist. And of course, the compliance shock being non-compliant. It's like a corporate heart, heart attack. As you see, they have to spend quite a lot of time setting this up. They have to tell you what each piece of this metaphor is doing. Who's what? Who is the surgeon? They've got to set all this up. And then obviously the writer clearly recognizes this is quite a lot of mental burden to throw in the first two lines of an email. So they put this little thing I've highlighted here. They sort of <laughs> go back to it. Acting as corporate cardiologists, like, you know, that thing I just wrote. Yeah, remember that? <laughs> so it's a little fuddly already. This bit in green though, this is the good bit, right? So they get to the end and they have this nice surgical precision descriptor, lovely. They then talk about things like good bedside manner in ENC practitioners. You know, stuff like this is, is great. They talk about prevention uh, being better than cure, serious illnesses needing immediate resolution. This is all good stuff. And this is the bit you want. This is the bit that actually clarifies what they're trying to talk about. They just had to get through a lot of words to reach that point. Um, the payoff is good, but I'm not sure it was worth it. So <laughs> this is an interesting one to tweet, by the way, because I really tried hard to keep the metaphor and, and make it just a little smoother. But um, I realized that would kind of break the rule I've just told you not to do. So I've kept it very simple, just gone for putting your compliance to the test. Uh, I've changed it to just a compliance shock. It's pretty obvious what that means. Um, and then saying that if you don't do anything, you could be at risk. You've got to change, change your approach. A stress test is going to help you do that. Join our webinar and we'll tell you how that works and what it looks like. I know it's, it's not fancy. It's boring in comparison to our corporate cardiologist one. Um, but sometimes this is the job. We just need to be clean clear and hopefully get really good results. So what are we going to do to prevent this from happening in the first place? You need to keep simplicity as your guiding star and sometimes be prepared to get out of your own way. Yes, you're a very, very clever writer of marketing. I know because you're here listening to me. But <laughs> sometimes we need to not be clever. We just need to be effective, which is a sad thing to say, but there we are. 
I would recommend, I'm not saying you can never use puns or metaphor, by the way. I would just set an impossibly high bar for them. I would really interrogate everyone you use and go, is this actually making anything clearer? In particular, if you are writing for a specific industry or sector, the bar needs to be so high you can almost never clear it. <laughs> because while you're dabbling in the world of, say, logistics and transport management, the person you're writing to has been in it for 20 years. So your very clever thing about driving better results and getting the brand in the fast lane, they're going to be rolling their eyes and just probably going to ignore you. <laughs> so yeah, they've heard it all before. Unless you've got a genuinely fresh pun about that industry, which I mean, if you do fair play, put it down. But if not, I'd steer clear. I just said steer clear, which is a pun about transport. Sorry. <laughs> I'm breaking a lot of my own rules today. Um, again, just reiterating, you want to sound good rather than clever. Something can flow nice, it can use some clever writing tricks to, to sound good and have impact, but we just want to leave the, the wordplay and the puns out of it for a little bit. Okay, before we move on to the next one, I've seen a QA thing pop up. David, would you be willing to read it out to me? Yes, indeed. Uh, it's Emily. She says, could metaphors also lose people who don't have English as a first language? Ooh, that is a great point, Emily. That is really good, actually. I haven't even crossed that yet because it's quite a niche use case. But yes, <laughs> metaphor is extremely difficult to translate, right? So whether you're writing for somebody who uses English as a second language, they obviously have to translate it in their own head and it can very quickly get lost. Or, heaven forbid, if you're working on a piece that has to be localized by another company, you are really setting them up for a hard time. <laughs> that job is really difficult. Um, so don't make it any harder for them. This is another reason, I think, to keep things clear. Um, just a tiny example for you. I won't take too long with this, but I had a really good one quite early in my career where I was writing a piece that was going to be translated into Spanish. And I talked about how if you used a particular type of uh, database, you could reap the benefits of a more efficient organization. And um, I was told basically that the, the, that idea of reaping the benefits translates very poorly into Spanish. It is like it's, it's all associated with death. It's not like the reaping of like corn in a field. It's like the reaping of souls and the grim reaper. Um, probably a better fit for a heavy metal lyric than, uh, than a piece about databases. So I, I learned that the hard way. Um, so that's a great point, Emily. Thank you for asking that question and giving me an opportunity to give you a quite laboured anecdote. <laughs> so thanks everyone for listening to that. It's always fun to share battle stories. It might be, sorry, I'm just, I'm, I'm aware if she's still in the room that, that, that Anya's here as well so it might be mm -hmm. that if we want to talk more about translation we can maybe do that later in the q and a if um mm. if Anya wants to give give us any um insights in the in the chat as as we go as to how easy or hard metaphors are in the uh, mm. in, in the translation because I know that's Anya's specialism Anya if I knew we had an expert like you in the room if I'd really thought about that, I wouldn't have said so much about it. Because maybe you'll tell me that I'm completely wrong. It's actually okay to translate. <laughs> but you can let me know later. We'll have a little chat about it. It'll be a good time. But, uh, dum dum dum, we're going to move on to the final deadly sin. What you've all been waiting for. Not knowing your audience, which I hinted at earlier. And I know probably you're like, yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, we get told this all the time in content. Um, but I want to put a little bit of a spin on this. Because it's not so much about knowing your audience, like who they are, but it's more like what they know. Because I really think that a job title only tells you so much. I'm sure we've all uh, sent out briefing documents or received them. And you've got that, you know, who's the audience box. And people just fill in like C-level. <laughs> or they just run off job titles. Database administrator, database engineer. And you're like, okay. But really, it's kind of superficial information, right? Like, obviously, you need to know their job title. That, that helps you hone in on, on quite a bit. But, you know, I've seen those like persona documents, you know, where they like create characters where they're like, you know, engineer Eric and all this stuff. It's, it's quite fun. Helps you remember things. But knowing somebody's like age, it gives you a little bit. You might know a little bit more about their values and their level of experience, say, but I'm not sure that tells you as much as you want to know really about that person who's going to be reading the piece. I think the key is to know what they know, you know, particularly getting quite granular with it. Like if you're writing about a particular topic in your industry, does this person know a lot about it? Do they, do, do they sort of, is this familiar to them, but maybe it's got a twist? Is this just old hat and you want to speed through it? Because you obviously don't want to bamboozle someone with loads of really complicated stuff they've never come across before, but you also don't want to teach grandma to suck eggs. They'll be sitting there rolling their eyes like, yeah, I've heard of the clown, get to the point. So we need to know, of course, what they know and also who they know, because we obviously want to be as specific as we can with our audience, right? If you know you're writing for just a CIO, 
you can be really targeted about the challenges that they're facing, the benefits they're going to get from a particular solution. But if there's other people involved in that decision-making unit uh, that, that they have to get signed off on, we suddenly need to cast the net a little bit wider, right? Because sure, your technical engineer may be providing something more about an Ethernet switch or something fun and jazzy. Obviously, you'll cram in loads of technical detail for them, but then they've got to send it to like the CFO or the procurement uh, um, head. And, you know, they're going to be looking at it like, I don't know what this means. <laughs> so you kind of suddenly need to try and find a way to get information in for them. They're like, yeah, it's going to save you money. It's going to cut this many man hours out of your engineer testing or whatever. So that's really going to shape how you focus in your, your content. So I've got a bit of an example for you here. Compliance people again, sorry. And of course, I know I'm not a compliance professional. I'm not the target audience for this, right? Uh, and if they are specifically aiming at compliance professionals in United States-based organizations, this is good. It's very specific. It's got a lot of technical acronyms and jargon that let you know, yeah, this is for you, Mr. US-based compliance professional. But if there's any doubt that it can go to people who aren't in compliance or aren't based in the US, I think we need to do a few things. Um, you know, we're looking at things like the 10K, uh, 10Q filing, which is an SSC filing uh, requirement. Um, we've got ESG language disclosures, which is a pretty well known acronym in that circle, but maybe not more broadly. Um, SEC, of course, you probably know that, but maybe not, if not in that industry. Go back to 10Ks and 10Qs, which might be unfamiliar territory. What would I do to tweak it? Um, it's quite easy. You can kind of just find substitutes, which it's a careful balance. We don't want to damage our credibility. We don't want someone who is a seasoned compliance veteran to look at this and go like, yeah, this person doesn't know my needs. They don't know my industry at all. But if we're trying to cast the net a little wider and a little broader, we can do things like that. But we're just removing the acronym and calling it as it is. Um, I've of course mentioned that there's going to be a panel of experts and we're going to review these three things. Worked on the bullet points. So I've spelt out what ESG is, but then put it in brackets. So we're saying like, look, we're not idiots. We know that this is a known term. Here's the acronym. But just in case you don't spell it out once. Um, I've been a bit cheeky and just put guidance bodies like the SEC. You're going to learn some of these things from the SEC and others. Um, obviously, I'm making an assumption they do cover beyond the SEC filings in this um, webinar. Maybe they don't. But things like that can just make it so that maybe the, the audience who's landing on this is based in the US. But what if they want to send it to a colleague who works in their like Canada or, or French office and suddenly, you know, they might be looking at it going, oh, OK, this isn't for me then. So we want to avoid that. So something like that can help. Um, and I just changed 10Q and 10K to quarterly and annual filings. It's a little simpler. Um, but again, like I said, this might be an over edit. If you knew for sure, 100%, all your audience was going to be based in the US and a seasoned vet, you wouldn't need to do this. But it's got some good ideas, hopefully, in there for you about how you might tweak it to broaden that a little bit for a wider decision making unit. What are you going to do to avoid this in general then? You've got to understand the hot topics in your target industry. Um, I've seen loads of B2B tech content that talks about the cloud like it's a new thing. <laughs> so don't do that. Um, you've got to know how familiar the audience is with the topic you're writing about. You can obviously talk about basic things everyone knows. You might need to to set the scene. But if you know that they know it really well already, you can just speak through that. Um, that's it. Thanks for sticking with us. I know that was quite a long one. There was a lot to get through. I'm just going to summarize. We've had seven sins. Here's your seven top tips to avoid them in rough order of how you might approach a piece. You're going to think about your audience. You're going to think about what they know specifically to help guide you on how granular you need to get in your copy. You're going to ask those stupid questions and your subject matter expert or stakeholder is probably going to thank you for it when they get really, really strong copy out at the end. You're going to work out what info to include, and what to ignore. And I want you to be as brave as possible <laughs> about going back to your stakeholder and going, nope, sorry, we're not putting any of that in. We need to stay focused. Uh, I'd urge you to plan out your narrative structure in advance just to work out any weak links between sections and try and shore them up. Get to the point as quickly as you can. No extended elaborate intros, please. Keep it simple. Keep the metaphors to yourself. Tell them to your colleagues and have a good chuckle over the water cooler. Don't put them in your coffee necessarily. And of course, edit, edit, edit again. But I don't need to tell you all that. You're all doing it pretty well so far. Right. Whew. Pretty breathless after all that. Maybe you are too. But if you've got any questions for me, now's the time to ask. Of course, you can ask questions about the webinar. You can ask me questions about writing, life, the universe. Well, I'll add answers, but I can try. While we're waiting for uh, for people to to type their their, their questions and um, and and to find out whether you know Anya is happy to be picked on to talk about <laughs> translations and metaphors, um, 
is there one thing here if you, if you could only take one tip or you know or you could only kill one sin what what would it be <laughs> hmm probably the editing one right like i came back to it quite a few times um i didn't want to make this like really basic in the sins i've covered by the way as you might notice i tried to go for more like high level like how you approach copy because i thought if i just told you don't make typos that's like such an obvious thing it, it wouldn't be worth saying but i think that sort of stuff has a huge impact, right? Like you could see an amazing piece of content and then you see a rogue typo right at the end. And suddenly like, it just sort of discredits the brand you're, you're representing. It's a really unfortunate thing. It happens to everyone. The only way to stop it is to edit really well. So that's the one I'd go for. The one thing you're gonna take from this is that, and that's good. <laughs> good stuff. Um, Anya's happy to chat. Um, in, in, we'll do that in, in a moment. I have a, a, another question from Emily. Mm, uh, nice. If you don't have enough information about the audience, is mm. it worth seeing if you can talk to the salespeople who are dealing with them to get more info? Absolutely. Um, I think the link between sales and marketing is very crucial in most organizations for this exact reason. Um, if you can talk to a salesperson, it's absolutely incredible for that because not only do they know a lot about the audience, of course, because they talk to them every day, they will be able to give you stories about talking to that audience that will tell you so much more than a job title, a few lines and a brief will tell you. You will learn way more from a single anecdote than anything else. So you're spot on, Emily. Talk to sales if you can. Not always easy because they're busy people, but <laughs> if you can speak to them, they are an untapped resource in the organization, especially for those of you working in-house who hopefully have a direct line to people in sales. If you can talk to them, please do. Okay, I'm just going to see if I can switch on Anya's microphone so Anya can tell us about um, whether metaphors are indeed difficult to to translate and to uh, and to localize. You might it might help to start by introducing yourself, Anya. Oh, I can't quite. Hello, hello. Oh, there you <laughs> are. There we are. Okay, sorry. <laughs> what you can't see is I have this weird robotic arm on the side that I have to keep wiggling up and down to make sure it's on. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, so hi, yes, I'm Anya. I'm, I'm the managing director of uh, AGAT. We are a uh, translation and localization specialist for the European market. So we translate a lot of business to business marketing content, um, predominantly for UK companies as well as American companies who want to come into the European market. So lots of white papers, lots of eBooks, lots of websites and, and the kind of collateral that, that you all know about very well. Um, to come to the question about metaphors, generally I would say um, it's not a problem for someone, a professionally trained translator to see a metaphor and then translate it in a way that makes sense in the target market. I think um, your example of reaping the benefits, of course, if you translate it literally, that might cause issues, but you know, a professionally trained translator would look at that and like, okay, well, what's the idea behind here? And they might end up translating it in a very straightforward way. So being you know, being more to the point and avoid the metaphor, or if there is another fitting metaphor in their language, then they can choose to swap it out. I think, so generally I wouldn't avoid metaphors just to kind of make internationalization easier. But when it comes to things like uh, ad copy, you know, advertising campaigns where copywriting is involved, if you're dealing with metaphors there, I would be more careful. And if you know it's gonna go into other languages, try, you know, see if you can involve the, the translation teams, if at all possible in the, you know, and not in the, I guess the creative process, but maybe just checking before you go too far down the line to see that you're not making some, you know, potential faux pas later on when you translating it into other languages. Does that make sense? Mm. Yeah, no, thank you for adding that, Anya. I uh, clearly haven't, haven't given localizers enough credit about <laughs> how they can handle that. I'm sorry. Um, this is probably more about my uh, very poor uh, secondary language skills than, <laughs> than your profession. Um, so in general, is, is, is the message we take from that then that shorter copy probably benefits more from simplicity? Do you have more wiggle room or something like that in a longer piece than ebook, would you say? I guess it depends how how in depth your metaphor is and how much mm. it weaves through the copy. I suppose if you're saying something like reaping the benefits, you know that's a it's more like a, a turn of phrase that could be easily localized. But um, 
yeah, if it's a if it's a much bigger metaphor that doesn't work in another language that kind of threads through the entire like white paper, for example, that might cause bigger issues for sure. Mm. Absolutely. Great. Well, thank you for that. I'm wondering now if there's anything else I've always wondered about localization. That <laughs> <laughs> I'm available for chats anytime. <laughs> oh, nice. I'm glad to hear it. I might take you up on that. Um, David, how are we doing on Q&A? Have we got any more through from people? Um, no, I think uh, so far either people are typing very slowly or they're, they're quite happy with, uh, with everything that they've heard, George. Nice. Well, either I've covered everything then or you've already got me on the second screen and tuned out doing something else. <laughs> oh, em blame you. Emily's getting involved. Emily's uh, getting very yeah, involved. Questions from Emily. This is great, Emily. Yeah. Have you ever tried empathy mapping to build better persona knowledge? Ooh. Um, I hate to reveal my ignorance here, Emily. I'm not even sure I know what empathy mapping is. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, I don't get the opportunity to get that involved in personas. Normally, by the time something comes to me, I'm just told, right, this is it. This is the information you've got. Work with it. Very occasionally, I might be able to ask, like, does this person know much about this technology? That's about the extent of how involved I can get in that process, unfortunately. Um, if you're able to tell me more about it, I'd love to hear about it. <laughs> uh, Emily, would you like us to um, switch your, your microphone on so that you can tell us a bit about it? Cool, cool. I'm it's liking this up. people jumping in business. This yeah, is great. it's good, isn't it? All it's star nice, ensemble nice, cast. Nice and interactive <laughs> and always good to hear Emily's voice. Hi everyone, um, I'm Emily King. I'm a senior writer and editor at a software company called Blue Fruit Software. We're actually based sort of up the road uh, from uh, Radix. Cornwall um, Massif. <laughs> um, empathy mapping is a thing I've learned from uh, user experience UX um, side of things because we've got some UX experts in the house. Um, I can't quite describe it right now, but it's something that's it's worth looking up. It kind of gives you a kind of a canvas to, to map ideas to that are around certain themes that aren't things like age and stuff so it helps you to to map things like pain points um things they might be aiming for you know it, it kind of gives you a different idea to either take some some assumptions or some knowledge ideally some knowledge like if any interviews or anything have been done and certainly if you talk to salespeople, like if you've got managed to talk to salespeople, to take that information and put it to it um, to help you like really consider what might be going on with a particular sort of audience, basically, mm -hmm. like, and the more specific, the better, especially if it's maybe someone in a specific organization, you know, a particular role in a specific organization, because you could obviously talk about stuff that might be have been revealed in, I don't know, like, especially in ABM, you know, something that, mm -hmm. you know, like a, uh, annual report or similar, you know, and sort of map things from that basically um but yeah it's a, it's a ux technique um and we've been trying it out for some of our persona work amazing what kind of results have you had using it has it been a, a bit of a hit um we haven't done enough development on it yet but it has helped us focus some of our certainly the abm side um and um a little bit on our um ebook that we had out recently mm, that sounds really cool i mean that sounds much more like the kind of information that as a, as a writer, I'm sure you'd agree, you'd, you'd kind of want to know about an audience rather than just, you know, this person is a 50 year old IT engineer. <laughs> so that sounds really good. I'm glad you're able to jump on and tell us a bit more about it. Emily. Thanks very much, Emily. That's, um, that's super. Um, mm. I think that's probably all the, the, the questions that, that we have from the, uh, the audience today, George. Um, Great. Obviously well, I they, appreciate they, they did right in. They can get mm. in touch with us. Um, offline or on, on social media if they want to as well. Yeah, there's a few links there for you if you want any more. We uh, uh, obviously have our newsletter that you can sign up to. You can follow us on Twitter. And if you want to get in touch with us about anything, there's an email address and web link for you there. Um, thanks very much for the people who stuck it out. And it's been a bit of a long one, slightly longer than I intended, but I do have a tendency to ramble when I'm on a topic I like. <laughs> but thanks everyone for joining in and for your questions. It's been great. Thanks very much, everybody. Uh, thank you, George. I'm sure that, uh, yes, Lots of um, uh, thanks coming through for you. Oh, in the, thanks, David uh, and Michelle. In, in, in oh, the chat. Gosh, That's great. Thanks. Oh. thanks. They've been quiet throughout, and now they're mm. and now, now we're at the end. They're, um, oh, uh, thanks, they're, they're they're chiming in, and quite quite rightly so. So, on behalf <laughs> of of of, um, of of our audience, I'll I'll thank you for that, George. That that was great. Um, to uh, for you um, watching, uh, you know, I say watching at home, but you know, you might be in your office. Um,
by uh, by all means, if you if you want to follow us on on Twitter or uh, connect to us on the uh, the newsletter, we will uh, keep you updated. We uh, hope that uh, we'll tempt George to do more of these in future. Um, so if you want to keep updated um, as we do, turn the webinar into into perhaps a series. Who knows? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, as those uh, become live and you can uh, register for those, um, then, then get yourself over to the, uh, the newsletter. Um, uh, Syed wants to know uh, just briefly, can you get a link to the, uh, the session? Uh, yeah, it will be uh, available on demand afterwards uh, once we get that all straightened out. And uh, hopefully we'll put it up on YouTube so that you can um, you know, share it with people and, and watch from the, uh, uh, the beginning as well. Um, so th thank you very much for that. Thank you for coming. Thank you, George. And we'll see you again in future. Bye now. Bye.